Our next speaker is Dr. Myron Yaster. Dr. Yaster graduated summa cum laude from Brooklyn College before attending SUNY Downstate, where he was also a, a cum laude graduate. He graduated in 1977 and is celebrating his 40th reunion today. After medical school, he did two years in, of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and then residency in anesthesia at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and fellowship in pediatric anesthesia and critical care medicine at the Children's Hospital of, Pen of Philadelphia, CHOP. From 1982 to 2016, uh, Dr. Yaster was at Johns Hopkins, rising from instructor to the Richard J. Traceman Distinguished Professor of Pediatric Anesthesia, and has achievements, many achievements, including establishing the Pediatric Pain Service. This past year, he moved out to Denver to the Children's Hospital of Colorado. He has over 100 publications in prestigious journals and has authored 64 book chapters and has been editor of important textbooks, including The Golden Hour, The Handbook of Advanced Pediatric Life Support, The Handbook of Pediatric Pain Management and Sedation and Pain in Infants, Children, and Adolescents. He has had funding from the Blaustein Pain Foundation and from the NIH. Um, he has served as president of the Society for Pediatric Anesthesia and has received um, that society's Lifetime Achievement Award, and that award is now named after him. The title of Dr. Yaster's talk today is very timely. The world is full of obvious things that no one ever sees, the epidemic of non-medical use of prescription opioids. Welcome, Dr. Yaster. We're it's great to be here. It's, um, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, I should say that um, <laughs> with, with, you know, my son recently moved, my son who's a lawyer for the Department of Justice, just uh, bought a, a sort of a modest house in Brooklyn two years ago for over a million dollars in a neighborhood that when I was a student at Downstate, I would have been afraid to drive through. <laughs> so um, things have definitely changed. I mean, I think Brooklyn has, in fact, become the hottest spot in the universe. Um, I have a couple of disclosures. Um, I'm, I am going to be talking about opioids today, obviously. And um, I have been a paid consultant and on the DSMB for several major pharmas and two of the, uh, two of the um, Purdue Pharma and Endo Pharmaceuticals. I will be talking about their drugs a little bit so that um, when that comes up, I'll be sure to point that out to you. And because I'm primarily going to be talking about children, it's important to know that uh, anytime any drug is discussed in pediatrics, they're almost never used on label. So it's important to know that as well. Okay. I have a couple of objectives today. Um, I'm going to describe a process of discovery as much as the problem itself in terms of the delivery of health care. And some of the things that I'm going to be talking about may, in fact, be very valuable in your own practice. Um, I'm also going to go discuss at some length how we went from the problem of undertreatment of pain to one to an epidemic of opioid addiction in the country, and I'm going to outline some future directions. So let me start with this very famous phrase from Sherlock Holmes, and that is, the world is full of obvious things which nobody ever sees. So let's do a little test. This is the FedEx sign. You've all seen this every single day, right? Do you know that there's an arrow in there? Can any of you, you know about that? There. Now, you've seen the FedEx sign every day, but you've never seen the arrow. Now, there's a really bad thing about today's lecture, by the way, and that is from this point forward, you will never be able to see the FedEx sign and not see the arrow. <laughs> So this process of discovery that I'm going to now outline started by a simple observation. Um, I was the director of the pediatric pain service at Johns Hopkins, and when patients were going home, their, their outpatient prescriptions were handwritten prescriptions that were written by the, serv the primary services, not by the pain service. So if it was an orthopedic surgeon, the orthopedic surgeons would do it. If it was a medical patient, the medical services would do it. And the pain nurses noticed that a very large number of the prescriptions had errors in them. So um, 
the, and the errors were what you might think, incomplete information, failure to use best prescribing practices, and so on. So I had a choice to make. I could simply fix the problem by saying that the House staff couldn't write the orders anymore, or I could study to see what actually, is this really a problem? So the obvious thing is, it, is there really a problem? Were we just not seeing it? So for a second, I'm going to just take a little break from the normal way of lecturing, and I'm going to ask you all a question. So how many of you think that in a handwritten narcotic prescription, the error rate is less than 1%? If you do, if you think that that's the rate, stand up. So nobody stood up. How about 10%? Anybody think that the error rate in a handwritten opioid prescription is 10%? Nobody's standing up. 25%. If you think that's the answer, stand up. So I see, let's see, a couple of people. Keep standing. Or actually, you can sit down. How many think it's 50%? Stand up. It's a good way to get your mo yourself moving a little bit too. How many of you think it's greater than 50%? Now, what kind of business can exist <laughs> that the error rate of the people in the business think it's somewhere between 50 or greater than 50%? Would you buy a cell phone from a company that would fail one out of two times? But in medicine, we just accepted it, or we didn't see it. Although we sort of knew it, we didn't see it. So we decided to do a study, and what we did is we did this secretly. We got our hospital's IRB to approve it, and we had to do it secretly where we photographed prescriptions, because if people knew that we were looking at their prescriptions, it would affect how they wrote their prescriptions. This is sometimes referred to as a Hawthorne effect. So we, over a six-month period, just photographed prescriptions. And what we, f we used certain basic criteria of what prescription errors would be, you know, illegible handwriting, uh, incomplete numbers, wrong patient, wrong drug, wrong dose, using the micro symbol, the Greek micron symbol, instead of the MCG. They would do a micro for micrograms. And we published our results in one of the major journals. And what we found is that the error rate was, in fact, over 70 percent. It's just, now, no business can exist this way, but we in medicine just accepted it. Um, and the errors were not only single errors, there were often multiple errors. And when you have multiple errors, errors can line up so that a single error may not be a problem. But if you have multiple errors, the whole, like if you, the, the classic thing is about Swiss cheese that you Swiss, the, the holes in a Swiss cheese block are randomly placed so that if you try to, say, stick a, a, a pin through one hole, it won't go to the other end of the block because the holes are randomly distributed. But if you take that Swiss cheese block and cut it into slices, you can sort of arrange it so that the holes will all line up. And this happens very frequently when there are errors in prescription rating. One error may not do it, but if you have multiple errors, you can get a catastrophe. And that's what we saw in several of the prescriptions. So, how do you reduce these errors? Well, you could say that only specialists could write it. You could, you could have pharmacists review it. You could do all kinds of things. And we decided that the way to do this was with computer, a, a, writing a, a narcotic prescription writer that would, only, that would have built-in safety. So you get a perfect prescription when it was done. And uh, in order to make this work, we pulled every paper prescription pad in the hospital. So the only way that a narcotic could be written was using our prescription writer. And what we found was by doing this that we were able to produce a perfect prescription. And I just want to show you some of these things, that, that this is how, why this is sort of different. It has the name clearly spelled out. It has the person who wrote the prescription clearly spelled out. It has errors that can happen spelled out. So for example, nobody can tamper with this prescription and write 300 by putting an extra zero by that 30. It says 30 ml plus it's written out as 30. So it can't be turned into 300. Um, it, it, so it, it took an error rate of 70 plus percent, putting this into play, change, brought that error rate to zero. Very simple. 
it took an error rate of 70% or more and made it zero. And we published those in several journals. This is just one of them. So when people said it was impossible, it was very possible. But you had to see the problem and then fix it. OK, so we did a great job. That should be the end of the story. But it isn't the end of the story. A couple of years ago, I decided to, to, take, to do another study to just look at something that I was very curious about. We now have this gigantic database, 40, 50,000 prescriptions. I was curious to know what were doctors prescribing. So I didn't really care what they were prescribing. I was just curious what they were prescribing. What was the medicine? What was its formulation? And so on. And we studied that and published those results. So we studied almost 35,000 prescriptions and published it in one of the major anesthesia journals. And we found some really interesting things. We found that opioids are, writ are prescribed across the age group. So there had long been this belief that opioids are not really prescribed in pediatrics. And in fact, as they're prescribed in very high numbers, uh, probably in, in just one hospital, there was five to 7,000 prescriptions a year. And that's just a moderate size hospital. So it's, it, it's, they're used commonly, and they're used in all age groups. And we were very curious as to what was being prescribed. And I'll just give you, we'll come back to this a little later. But w the most commonly used prescription was this one in blue, which is oxycodone. And we'll go into why that is in a few moments. We also found that opioids were prescribed both in tablet and liquid form. And I should tell you that that was one of the things I was really curious about in doing the study. I wanted to know how many of these prescriptions were in liquid. Now the reason for that is if the drug pharmaceutical industry did not want to produce, does not want to produce drugs for the pediatric market. And one of the reasons they don't want to do it is they said, well, why, sh why should we go to all this trouble? Number one, it won't be used. Well, that's wrong. It is being used. Number two, we'd have to make a liquid preparation, and no one's going to use that. And what we found in this study was a couple of really interesting things. In the very young group, liquids which are in red, not surprising, right? You'd expect someone who's two, three, five, six years old to need a liquid medicine. So that's not, as, that's not really surprising. But what was really surprising and sort of was a, a revelation to the drug industry was that older children, and actually older and adults, also need liquid preparations. Now, they don't want to make them, but this will now force them. This is being used by the FDA to force the manufacture of liquid preparations because there are new rules in terms of how the FDA works that if a drug is being released in the market, they must produce a pediatric formulation if it's being used in pediatrics. This demonstrates that liquid formulations are used not only in the very youngest of children, but actually in older children. And I would suspect, for those of you who do adult internal medicine and geriatrics, a lot of your patients need liquids as well. Remember, the theme of this is that the world is full of obvious things that nobody ever sees. So I wasn't this was not part of the original plan. The plan was to see what was being prescribed and what formulation. But in the database, it also had how much was being dispensed. And we found this astonishing thing, that in all age groups, all formulations, that the amount of medicine that was dispensed was enormous. That every prescription had 50 or more tablets or 50 or more MLs very large amounts of opioids were dispensed. I wasn't really expecting that. We also found one other very interesting thing for those of you who are curious, like for many of you who are older, the most common, as, my, as I am myself, um, the most common opioid that was in use when I entered practice was codeine. It's gone. Codeine is gone. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it very quickly. Codeine has no analgesic properties. I'll say that again very out loud, very slowly. Codeine has no analgesic properties. Um, it actually only makes you vomit. Um, it must be metabolized by the CYP2D6 system into morphine to become active. So if you don't have that 2D6 P450 microenzyme system, all you get is the codeine. You don't get the morphine. And it turns out that a fair number of people, all newborns and about 7% of the American population, don't have it. That's not such a terrible thing because it's not going to hurt you. It'll just make you nauseous. 
the bad thing is that there are over, there are people who have too much of that, that system, and instead of converting 10% of codeine into morphine, 30 or 40% can be converted into morphine, and there have been multiple deaths reported with it. So because of that, in 19, in, you can see in the year 2013, the FDA came out with a really strong black box warning saying, do not use this drug in children. Really, it should not be used in anybody. Um, and basically, you can see that the numbers went to basically zero after that black box warning. And the FDA is a really important organization that, for, for those of you, I'm not going to say anything about our current president and the administration, but the FDA is being gutted. And it's really important for all of us in medicine to be very attuned to this, that their budget's being cut by 30 percent. And they're there to protect us. And they're to protect us not only from bad drugs, but also from this kind of stuff. So pay attention to it. Okay. So we, in just a quick review, we found that the CPOA system of using the narcotic prescription order could eliminate the record uh, uh, errors. We found that liquid formulations were used across the board and that the most common opioid in the practice at Hopkins at the time was oxycodone and its codeine has basically s disappeared. But the surprise finding of this study was that regardless of the opioid prescribed, providers, and I'm using the word providers here very carefully because it's not just physicians, remember, increasingly the number of people who are re writing the prescriptions are not MDs, it's nurse practitioners and physician's assistants. No matter who is writing the prescriptions, they're writing for very large quantities. So bringing back my Sherlock Holmes hat, this led to mo many more questions. Is, are these opioids effective in treating pain? Who is getting the pain? Who is prescribing the pain? How much of the controlled substance is left over at the end of treatment, at the end of 10 or 14 days? Is opioid therapy required for as long as 10, 14 days or, or a month? And what do we know about where the medicine is stored in the house? And what happens to the leftover medicine? So, that led to the next study that was done, and it will, the results that I'm now going to show you is stuff that was just accepted for publication. It'll be published sometime in October, I believe. Um, so again, we found that all of the prescriptions occur across the age group, mostly as you get older, but it, it, that ch children of all ages receive opioid prescriptions. Now, if I had to ask, I'm just going to stop for a second before I show you these results. Who do you think writes most Re prescriptions for opioids, for, for, you know, follow, not in the hospital, but when patients go home. Surgeons probably, right? But which surgeons do you think, which, which branch of surgery writes the most? Orthopedics. Orthopedics, far and away. They write almost 50% of all prescriptions. Now, what you don't see up here is something that I just discovered having moved to Colorado, and we're doing the same sort of study there is, you know who number two is? This blew me away. No, no, not, not who's writing it, but which group? We said orthopedics is number one. Which is the next group? Dentists. Dentists, oral surgeons. So when I was a kid, when I was a kid, the rite of passage was to get your tonsils taken out. It just meant your parents had insurance of some sort, right? Nobody actually needed their tonsils taken out, but we all had our tonsils taken out. In the current generation of people, the rite of passage is getting your wisdom teeth taken out when you're between 13 and 18. They all get it taken out, and they all get opioid prescriptions. And they all get opioid prescriptions, as we'll find out very shortly, for 50 or more tablets. Again, the most common that opioid that we saw in our practice was oxycodone. And this is a very important thing that I want to spend a moment about because it's a little bit different than the rest of the United States. If you look at most of the United States, the most commonly used oral opioid is hydrocodone plus acetaminophen, Lortab Vicodin. Now the reason for that is until two years ago, hydrocodone, which is only available combined with acetaminophen, was a class three or class four drug by the DEA. Because the thinking was nobody could give too much of that stuff because you'll become Tylenol poisoned. That the dangerous drug in Vicodin and Lortab is not hydrocodone. That dangerous drug is acetaminophen. 
So the FDA made it a class through the four drug. Oxycodone, on the other hand, when prescribed with acetaminophen, was also a class three or four drug, but when prescribed by itself, was a class two. So most physicians wrote for hydrocodone acetaminophen, or in the old days, codeine with acetaminophen, which didn't even require, it was, even, it was either class four, it didn't even require any kind of narcotic prescription pad. I mean, if you think about all the people who got Robitussin with codeine, that was almost over the counter. Okay, so why was it at Hopkins that everybody was getting oxycodone instead of hydrocodone acetaminophen? Well, I always have thought of this as a triumph of education and that we told our house staff, our faculty, our nurse practitioners, all of the people who wrote prescriptions not to write for the combination tablets because of the risk of acetaminophen poisoning. We wanted people to give acetaminophen but separately so that if patients were in pain and took extra doses of medicine, they wouldn't get too much acetaminophen. And the only drug available, the only opioid that's, that was available at the time that was by itself is oxycodone. Now remember I told you that I'm a consultant for DSMBs and several other studies for Purdue, the, the major manufacturer of it, but it's important to understand that oxycodone was used at Hopkins and in fact in most children's hospitals as the primary opioid be specifically because it's not combined with acetaminophen. We want people to take acetaminophen but we want to take it as acetaminophen plus oxycodone rather than as the combination tablet. The good news was that parents thought that the pain control was fabulous. They also thought that, you know, this was my Goldilocks question, too much, too little, just right, that almost everybody thought they had just the right amount of medicine, maybe too much, but no, very few people said, thought that they had too little. We also found that, again, liquids and tablets were dispensed, but again, a lot was dispensed, and now you can see what we also found was that a lot of the medicine that was dispensed was unused. And this, was a, this is a tremendous finding. This is, again, one of those moments where if you don't look, you don't see it, but if you look, you'll see it. And what we found was that less than 30, 40 percent of what was administered was used, which means that 60 percent or more was left over. Further, that nobody, virtually nobody was told how to get rid of these medicines. And even if they were told how to get rid of the medicines, nobody did it. And I should tell you this is still a real problem because the EPA says to don't flush this stuff down the toilet. The DEA says flush it down the toilet. And the, the worst of all ideas is to take the medicine back to a drugstore or the police station. That is never going to happen. That is the stupidest plan imaginable. We also found, as did other investigators, that the place that this medicine is stored is in the kitchen or in an unlocked medicine cabinet which means anybody can use it and find it. Okay, so before I go to my final couple of slides and finish, I've got five more minutes. Okay, before I go to my final thing, I'm just going to ask a question. You don't have to, I'm not asking you why, but again, this is going to be one of those things where you have to stand up. How many of you in the last 10 years have received a prescription for an opioid? If you have, stand up. For any reason, I don't care what it is. Okay, of those of you who are standing, in the last, since the time you got your prescription, has a teenager or young adult ever walked into your house? If the answer is yes, stay standing. If the answer is no, sit down. Well, as you can see, almost everybody is still standing. Now, you can all sit. I'm going to tell you something that I'm going to have you all do as a test when you're finished today. And it's not just about opioids. I want you to go to your medicine cabinet at home. And you will find medicines there that are 5, 10, 15, 20 years old or more. Nobody ever throws this stuff away. Now, I should tell you, I know a lot about this. I fractured my ankle two and a half years ago. I had major surgery. 
I got 120 oxycodone. I used 12. So where are the other 102 tablets? They're still in the medicine cabinet, <laughs> even though I know all about this. Now, why is that? Well, it's been this constant battle between me and my wife about this. My wife is actually a very famous physician, and her response is, well, you might need it. But so will the teenagers who walk through my house, and so will the house cleaner. And any time you have a party, any time you have a party in your house, or you have guests in your house, or a house cleaner, or a plumber, can I use your bathroom? Oh, absolutely. It's upstairs. They go into the, and open up the medicine cabinets. There's no videotaping of any of this, right? And they're going to find the little bottle of oxycodone, Vicodin, whatever you might have. And you'll never know that what's been taken or missing. Okay, so this, is this a problem? Well, take a look at this. So this goes to what I said to you earlier, that hydrocodone acetaminophen outsells oxycodone five to one. In the 1990s, because of the, really the undertreatment of pain, pain had been poorly treated or undertreated for generations. In the early 1990s, Dr. Jim Campbell and the, of the American Pain Society suggested that this is a national catastrophe and that we need to treat pain as a real disease and that the assessment and treatment, the assessment of pain should become the fifth vital sign. This swept the country and in fact it became a signal for how well your hospital or practice was working and it became key to your, in fact, to ability to get reimbursed. So you can see that with assessment came treatment, and since the 1990s, there's been a spectacular rise in the number of opioid prescriptions because of the perception that patients had a legitimate right. In fact, it was our moral responsibility as physicians and surgeons to treat pain. But this exactly paralleled the number of deaths that occurred from opioids, which is now a national epidemic that we actually have been fueling. Now, at the end of this, if you, I have some, some thoughts that are not part of this lecture, but I can also tell you like, what's different about the, the opioid epidemic today than from what you knew as students and as people who work in, in medicine. We can maybe talk about that at the end of this lecture. But the really, the big thing about this epidemic right now is that the fuel that starts the addiction is leftover opioid for medical prescriptions. People then become addicted, and then they switch from medical opioids to heroin because heroin is cheaper. These people are not stupid. The people who sell heroin undercut the price of opioids that are available from, that are prescription. So it became cheaper and easier to get than getting these leftover medicines. And the group that is at the greatest risk are adolescents, my population. Because adolescents are at a period of, of vulnerability when they are invulnerable or they think they're invulnerable. They have no impulse control. And they have this belief that opioids must be safe. They're not going to shoot up heroin. They know that that's bad. But opioids must be safe because a doctor wrote for it. And it comes in a pill from a pharmacy. But then once they get caught up in it, then they're screwed. And then again, remember, we give prescriptions for very legitimate reasons, but we don't have any method of where to dispose of it or if we even can dispose of it, which has, means that we, in our good intentions, have fueled an epidemic that is now the leading cause of death, more than traffic accidents, among people between the ages of 15 and 40, which is just staggering. So in this very fast New York speak of tone, I went very quickly, I went through a process of discovery, all of which was to just see what was there, but that nobody saw. And I should tell you that this process of discovery is continuing. Um, I have an NIH grant that's currently under review. 
looking to see can we better match what people need versus how much they get so that we can better match the amount of medicine dispensed so there is less left over. And in our preliminary results, we know that things that are important are the procedure, the gender of the patient, the age of the patient, and the ethnicity of the patient. And there may be other factors as well. But at this moment in time, we don't know. It's things that we need to study. My dream is that in the future, um, we will be able, when a, a surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon in particular, because they write 50% of these prescriptions, say they will be able to put in the patient. It'll come up automatically from the hospital's machines or the office computers, the patient's age, weight, race, sex, language. You'll know the name of the thing you're treating, and it'll match or at least give you quartiles of how much you actually patients use so we can better match what was dispensed to what patients actually use, so there'll be less left over. So we have to do a better job of matching how much we dispense to how much is used. We need to develop better methods of disposal, but the most important thing and the thing that I'm most worried about is that the pendulum is going to swing too far over. It already is swinging too far over so that, people, that many people who have a legitimate need for opioids to treat pain are not going to be treated for pain because of this fear of this opioid epidemic. And that's the worst possible outcome, or it's equally bad to having too much medicine left over. So we've got to better match what patients need versus what we dispense. And with that, I'll say thank you. I have, this was funded by several different organizations, including NIH. And um, none of this work would have been possible without my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, who both physicians, nurse practitioners, um, surgeons, who helped me do many of the studies that I talk through today. And with that, I'll say thank you. If any of you want this lecture, I believe some of it is, will be available, yes, on this. I think they're filming this for YouTube. But I can also uh, send you these slides to anybody who might want them. Um, the only thing I have to ask you is to wait about a week or two to do it. This is my email address. Um, because of this crisis with this new bug that's going on through, uh, through uh, the world, I can't send attachments or receive attachments for the next week, couple of weeks. But in a, a couple of weeks from now, if any of you want this, please feel free to shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you these slides. And with that, I'll take some questions. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. That's in my observation, both personally and with my patients, that there's very, very few cases that need oxycodone after two or three days of surgery or a significant. So injury. I actually have to tell it to you, I completely disagree with this, and I actually have data. So um, the, the the real problem is is that for many procedures, two or three days may be enough, but there are many orthopedic procedures where patients are still in pain seven, 10, or even more days later. No, no, I just want to say, I want to be very clear about this, because the government is going to come down and say that nobody can get it for more than three or four days. There is no data to match procedures and patient demographics to how much is actually needed. And before the government gives us sweeping, you can't get it for three or four days, we need the data to guide the prescriber so that patients who have pain posterior spine fusion, sort of some of the major, major orthopedic surgical procedures, will in fact be able to get as much medicine as they need. One more thing before you go on. Another study that we did recently, and it also is in press, it's actually going to go to the, in the journal of orthopedic, one of the, the, the major journal in orthopedic surgery that I did with my colleagues in orthopedics at the University of Maryland at Johns Hopkins in, an, in a very large private hospital group, where we asked surgeons we gave them five sort of cases and asked them how much they would prescribe and what drives the prescriber. And the important thing to understand is what's driving the prescriber. And what I can tell you, again, I have to keep it quiet because it's not public yet. It's not published, but the data is really strong and I think it's pretty clear. What do you think the number one reason is why orthopedic surgeons or really anybody prescribes too much medicine? So yes, so wait, hold, they don't want to be called. That's number one. What's number two? So that's number three. So it, was, it turns out that number, the number three reason was 
They don't want their online profile to be tagged as somebody who doesn't treat pain, and their hospitals are, set, are encouraging them to write as much because of Prescani, so that they, they're encouraged to prescribe as much as possible to, for their re reputation. There's a third reason, actually it's reason number two. Does anybody know what that might be? So we said they don't want to be bothered, online or personal reputation. No, well, actually, it, it's related to that, and that is, it's really hard to write a narcotic prescription, right? You've made it difficult. You can't just call it in. And it's not that the surgeon doesn't want to be bothered, but if patients run out, they have to come back to the hospital to get another prescription. So they don't want the patients to have to be burdened to come back to get another prescription, so they write enough to last for as long as they actually more than they think it will be needed, but they don't want patients to run out. And my great fear is that, is that what's going to happen is that the government is going to say, wait a second, nobody can get more than three days of medicine, whereas in fact there will be many orthopedic and other kinds of surgical procedures where three days or five days or seven days may not be enough. What we don't have, even in 2017, despite the fact that we've been writing opioid prescriptions for at least 100 years, we don't have any data evidence to guide the prescriber. Yeah. For opioids, I've had back surgery, you name it, three days is generally sufficient for most, for opioids. However, you still have some low-grade pain that's usually taken care of by uh, leave or some other effective medication. It's interesting that there's sort of a bell-shaped curve. Some people respond to leave, others to naproxen, et cetera. Uh, one doesn't necessarily respond to one, but respond to the other. That, you know, after 45 years of doing major surgery, I can tell you that in most cases, we overprescribe by a long shot the amount, but it's the perception we make the patients feel and believe they need this medication longer when they really actually don't. And I think that, I think it's we as physicians having fostered this on patients. So you keep on, it's like a Pavlov dog, you keep on telling one thing, one thing, one thing, and then everybody comes to believe it, you're not giving me enough pain medication. When probably you can handle the other. Now, the last question is, a set of and I thought a set of recently over the last couple of years has come into disrepute as far as effectiveness in relieving mild pain, and that's really a placebo. No, that's actually in, untrue. So, acid, so I, I, as I said earlier, I disagree with the, the duration of medicine to dispense, but I think it's important to understand that, uh, something about acetaminophen. So acetaminophen is a really interesting drug. Um, as you know, it is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor, so it's very much like, like uh, ibuprofen, but unlike ibuprofen or Aleve, naproxen or any of the others, it doesn't work through cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. It actually works through cyclooxygenase 3, which is only in the brain. So that's why you get the analgesic effects without the other effects on platelets and other organs, peripheral organs. But the other thing that is very clear right now, and I say this for somebody who now lives in the state of Colorado, <laughs> acetaminophen actually is known to be a very potent binder of the cannabinoid receptor. And some of the effects that we, that we have attributed to the analgesic properties of acetaminophen as a cyclooxygenase 3 drug may in fact be through the analgesic effects of the cannabinoids. So there's much more to know about that, but that's a whole nother lecture. I just, so please stand, please stand. It's my first simple question. How do I get rid of the uh, oxycodone that I received from my... So everybody asked me this question. So I'm going to tell you... Um, I'll tell you the, what I think is the smartest solution to this problem. And this is, we are now in Denver, we're writing this up to, as with the instruction sheet that we give to parents. Um, and I guess it would also be instruction sheet to give to adults. If you're not sure what to do, the best thing to do is flush it down the toilet. The fish will be easier to catch. <laughs> but if you don't want to do that, because you are environmentally conscious. The easiest other solution to do is to take a plastic bag, like a baggie with a Ziploc, put the 
the leftover medicine into the plastic bag with either, with the, the easiest thing to do is with dishwasher detergent or coffee grounds. Some people use cat litter, but it's best to have the drug first broken down in the liquid so that it's dispersed in a liquid and then mix it with either coffee grounds or cat litter. If you don't want to do that, just mix it with um, dish detergent and then throw it into the regular trash. That's the simplest, in 2017, that's the simplest way to do it. There are products available which use activated charcoal. Um, there are other things that are available, but on a simple mode, I tell parents choice A is if you can and you want to be environmentally friendly, use detergent or break it down and mix it with coffee grounds. If you don't want to go to that trouble, just flush it down the toilet, but don't leave it in the house. Why did this happen? Oh, well, I think it's, it's uh, over the last 10, 10, 15 years, and you can trace it directly to the move to make pain the fifth vital sign. It, it tracks it beautifully. Um, the, the thing, have I got like one extra minute, one or two extra minutes? Um, can, can I just, do, just, just sort of pontificate for a minute? So, look, I grew up in this town, and I moved to the heroin capital of the world, which is Baltimore. Okay? Baltimore. Baltimore has more... If, if, you are, if you're a black male in the city of Baltimore, under the, and you ha, you've been hospitalized for any reason before the age of 12, you have a one in four chance of being killed before you're 25. And the murder rate is directly related to the drug trade. There's nothing new about this opioid epidemic in the sense that we have, everybody in this room, every single person in this room, every physician in this room has known at Kings County Hospital and every other urban hospital in the United States that opioids have ravaged the black community for at least 60 plus years. Nobody gave a shit about it because it was the black community. That's the real answer. What makes, the, what makes this opioid epidemic different in 2017, it's white people, it's white male and female people, it's not just black males as the starter, and they live in suburbia and in rural America. And if you really want to do some interesting work and reading, and you draw a map of where the opioid epidemic is at its worst, and overlie it with the Trump voter, it's the same population. It is. It is. And that's, and that's why all of a sudden, everybody's scared shitless about this, because it's, in, it's involving middle class, or what was middle class, white, lower white middle class America, and you can track it economically. It's an economic tracking. As jobs disappear, people start to then become dependent on the federal government for disability. And the way they get their disability is often because of low back pain. They start on oral opioids. They move on to OxyContin because it's longer acting. And the train is out of the station. Yes? Uh, this may sound like, but the question about pain, I've, I've sort of seen it happen. My father was a general practitioner back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. He had a full cabinet of placebos and used them, and they seemed to work for a lot of people. I also went to China in the mid 70s, and I watched a open, open chest lung resection with the, uh, with the patient awake under uh, acupuncture. acupuncture. There are many other options we have for treating pain. I, I did some hypnosis on teenage people when I was in my residence, and, and you could deal with it. But this, this is not something that goes in our, and is ever taught to us to use for pain. And we going to have self-hypnosis <coughs> and so forth, because it doesn't give any money to our industry. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, no, no absolutely. There's no question. So there's no question that, that we, as physicians, we are, look, you can't, 
to do a really good pain management interview and treatment plan takes a minimum of an hour. That's not possible in our present method of reimbursement. And where you have to see, where you have to, where, where, but, but, well, good luck. Just, you know, move to a state, right. so, or, or move to, or move to a state, or move to a state that's red and make a turn. That, that I'm just saying to you that the the we have become addicted as physicians to the quick fix, take a pill, you're going to be better, whereas. You know, counseling doesn't get reimbursed. The most famous pain clinic in the United States was in Seattle. It was the birthplace of the chronic pain clinic. They folded because insurance, they couldn't, they couldn't, it was economically non-viable. <coughs> uh, this will be the last, que final, the question. final question. Thank you, Thank you very much for this. And after two weeks, I will be emailing you. Um, uh, you answered part of my first question about where it started and why it's now a public health crisis. So that was one question, so I get to ask another one. Have you done any studies about the prescription habits of doctors when it comes to different ethnicities? Because blacks are prescribed routinely less opioid medications than whites. And I just wonder if you've done any okay. studies. So, it, so the, the question is, for those of you who might not have heard it, was I remember I sort of mentioned that that the procedure makes a difference. I suggested that age may make a difference. The question is, does race make a difference? And so there are, so, so I should tell you that in the, the, the NIH proposal that I have sitting in council, I hope next, this week or next week, one of the big questions that we're looking at is race. Attached to race, which I think in 2017 is of equal importance, is not just ethnicity, but language. Do you speak English as your first language or a foreign language as your first language? And the solution to somebody who doesn't speak English is not to speak loudly and slowly. You, you, you actually need them to understand what you're saying and you have to understand what they're saying. And what we know is the following. This is well, well, well documented that black, Americans and Spanish-speaking Americans get prescribed significantly less medicine than white English-speaking Americans. What I don't know, and part of our study is not just what is being prescribed, but how much is actually consumed. Remember, there's a, there's a connection here. We're looking at not only what's being dispensed, but what's being consumed. And it may be that black and Latinos are getting prescribed less, but they may have less left over. So they may actually be more in a tune. We don't know. But there's no question that the issue of race, gender, ethnicity, age, all plays into how much is both dispensed and consumed. And again, as, you're, as, I've, as has been the theme of my whole lecture, the world is full of obvious things that nobody ever sees. We have to do the studies to sort of, to just look. And then the, and these are not subtle answers. They just jump off the page. Thank you. Oh, and before I get off the stage, if there's anybody from the class of 77 who's here, I hope we'll catch up to everybody at the end and during the break and maybe come up to the front because it's, it's been a really long time, 40 years, right? Thank you. <laughs>